Hey folks, and welcome back to the Oklahoma State University's Archives Live. My name is Olivia Turner, and I'm so excited to be talking with all of you today. And with me is David Peters, the head archivist here at the Oklahoma State University Library. David, how are you doing? Doing great, and wonderful to be with you again. Awesome, I'm so excited to be with you as well. So, as you may know, history is bound to repeat itself. And like many of you know, David and I are wearing masks and sitting six feet apart to follow Oklahoma State's guidelines for fighting the spread of COVID-19. But what many of you may not know is that this isn't OSU's first rodeo. About 100 years ago, Oklahoma State was also tackling the Spanish flu. David, could you talk to us a little bit more about the Spanish flu and its impact across Oklahoma and the United States? So the Spanish flu started about uh, February of, of 1918. Uh, it lasted in really actively through about April of, of uh, 19, uh, 1920. It came in, th in four waves. Uh, and so the first wave uh, in that spring of 1918 wasn't that, wasn't that big a deal. Uh, but the fall wave, the second wave that happened in October, September, October, November of 1918 was fairly severe and in Oklahoma, uh, estimated uh, about 100,000 people were infected, about 7,500 people died. Uh, and so uh, it did have quite an impact on, on the state and, and nation. Um, for Oklahoma State University, uh, once again, our, our highest uh, time period where we had our most infection was also in that fall of 1918, so. Interesting. So how did the Spanish flu differ from regular influenza symptoms? Uh, the first wave, not really that much. Um, you know, people would get fever, headache. Um, occasionally, people would develop uh, pneumonia uh, as a secondary infection. Um, but it was that second wave, and, and they're still trying to figure out, I think, if it was just a more virulent strain of the same flu. Um, but that second wave, um, more and more people began developing um, uh, pneumonia. Uh, they began getting these skin um, reactions uh, what it was, it was the human body's immune system overproducing, overreacting to the infection. And oftentimes that would cause problems. And so um, the, the second wave was really the worst, um, both in, in the, the impact it had on the human body uh, and then of course the numbers that I'd mentioned earlier. Uh, but usually pneumonia would be the, the actual final thing, a bacterial pneumonia would develop and, and that was what people would pass away of. That actually gave me goosebumps. I did not know that. That yeah. is so interesting. Um, so what did campus look like during the epidemic? So let's, let's go back just a little bit right before the epidemic. Um, the semester had started in September of 1918. We had about 1,700 students at the time. Um, uh, we had begun a, a student army training corps program in which young men who uh, were in the military, but they begin training um, uh, both their military exercises on, on college campuses but then also also take classes. And so we had a number of, of young men who uh, were in this training program and taking a lot of engineering classes uh, on campus. And so the campus uh, right before was a little more, um, I, I was militaristic isn't the term, but young men in uniforms uh, oftentimes, and they were doing a lot of drill and practice. Um, the campus is fairly uh, small at the time. Uh, we only have two residence halls on campus. And so, you know, of the students, I think we had a capacity of almost only about 200 students who could live on campus before that fall. With, with those Student Army Training Corps uh, uh, young men, they took the boys' dormitory, uh, which had a capacity of 120. It had 60 rooms, two persons per room. They doubled that to four persons per room and increased the capacity to 240. So the boys' dormitory increased its capacity for on-campus on housing. And then they converted an old uh, livestock pavilion which was just big, a big arena uh, with a dirt floor, but they converted it uh, for housing for another 250 uh, young men to stay there. And so, uh, so you have a high concentration of young people coming in in September from all over. Um, and you have uh, these, now they're, now they're concentrated in smaller areas. Uh, and so it's much more densely packed for student housing. Uh, and then you still have your large number of students who live in the Stillwater community in, in that area. Um, so that's kind of setting the, the, the scenario for, for what's going to happen then early in, in, that, uh, in that fall semester. But it was, it was the beginning of, of semesters like most. Uh, students actively involved with uh, activities and social activities and clubs and, and classes and, and just getting the semester started. So that's what campus was like. It was, yeah, so it was basically how campus 
was like last year before COVID, which also kind of started hitting around February. Right. Interesting. Right. Okay. So how well did students and faculty follow the guidelines that was given by Oklahoma A&M during the Spanish flu? So one of the challenges uh, uh, was the guidelines change, just like we've seen sometimes here. Um, so initially, like when students first arrived in September, uh, they would often go, there would be large groups of students, especially from ag, the ag school, um, ag, but now the College of Agriculture, Division of Agriculture, would go down to the state fair. Uh, and so uh, in, this, in the Oklahoma City papers, it was saying, oh, the, the flu isn't that big a deal. Just relax. It's okay to come to the fair. So we sent a lot of students and, and staff and faculty down to the state fair <clears throat> uh, within a few weeks. Oklahoma City doctors were saying, well, maybe this isn't as good as we thought. In fact, they had 19 deaths in Oklahoma City in one week. And then after that, that was about the middle of October, they shut things down. And that's when they started closing things up. And so initially, you know, as, as, as information was coming out, people reacted in different ways. I mean, some people you know, were encouraged to wear masks and, and they did. Other people didn't think they needed to. Um, Fresh air was considered a, a help, and so you know we didn't have air conditioning at the time in our residence halls, and so all the windows and doors were left open to get air flowing through there. Um, uh, people were encouraged not to shake hands, uh, to wash their hands, uh, and, and most people followed that. Um, by mid-October, um, the public schools were closed, the churches were not having services, um, and, and so they were kind of shutting, uh, movie theaters weren't showing uh, movies anymore. Uh, they didn't restrict um, uh, going out to eat, but at, at that time, very, many, very few people went out to eat. Um, they did encourage people to meet in groups of less than 12. Uh, and so most of the uh, clubs uh, and social groups shut down. They didn't have any, any activities. Uh, we had a football game the first week of October. We didn't have any more games until November, so they, they cut out football. Uh, so overall, um, with some variation, uh, you know, students and, and, and staff uh, and townspeople um, started following the procedures once the numbers started going up. And so initially it was kind of reluctance, oh, it's not that big a deal. And then when the numbers started rising dramatically, then people started uh, paying attention. Uh, the university never closed, uh, but attendance in class went way down. Uh, the football team still practiced all of through October even though it's sometimes less than half of the team members were out there because they were others were sick, uh, it just it just varied greatly. Uh, the the military still drilled, yeah, but they had sometimes less than 30 percent of the people who actually had been out there drilling. So, um, anyway, they they adjusted. So it's really fascinating how you covered <clears throat> basically how the city reacted to how the Spanish flu um, was impacting people, because that's really similar to how COVID. Um, pretty much shut down a lot of businesses. Uh, people in groups of 10 or less were encouraged, so you couldn't be in groups of more than 10. Uh, masks, social distancing, stuff like that. It's really interesting to see how Spanish flu was, is similar to how you know guidelines are being um, with COVID. And it's really interesting to see you know people today wearing masks, following social guidelines um, for social distancing, and just sitting back and thinking, you know, wow, it, this is almost a repeat, essentially. Different symptoms, of course, different disease, but, you know, reactions are similar. And it's really surreal to think about that. Um, but what I want to know is what you guys are thinking. Are there any similarities between COVID and Spanish flu that we haven't mentioned that you've noticed? Do you have any questions about the Spanish flu or any comments about it in general? Do you have any questions or comments about OSU? If you do, feel free to comment during this live stream, and we would love to hear what you have to say. While y'all are doing that, I actually got the opportunity to do something last week that I'm not very good at, and that is tap into my crafty side. Very not good at that. So what I got to do was make a Spanish flu era mask, and you guys get to come along with me as I show you how people survived and did what they had to do to get through the Spanish flu. Hey folks, so as many of you know, Oklahoma State is currently taking similar precautions today to battling COVID-19, as they did about 100 years ago to battle the Spanish flu. One of these similarities calls for wearing masks. Today, it's really, really easy to just go to the store and buy ready-to-wear, already-made masks. For example, I got this at Old Navy. Ready-to-wear, already-made. But it wasn't necessarily like that about 100 years ago, so they had to make their own. 
The Oklahoma State Archives Facebook posted about a week ago a picture of a flyer that was going around the OAMC campus, which basically showed students and faculty how to make a mask. It called for two items. It called for cheesecloth and string. So we are going to show you how to make a mask if we were living about 100 years ago during the Spanish flu. So you're going to take your cheesecloth, and it calls for the cheesecloth to be about 8 by 16 inches. You are then going to fold it to be about 8 by 8, like so, and then again to be like eight by four. So for time purposes, and because Olivia is really bad at crafts, um, we already went ahead and tied two of the corners required to be tied um, for this segment. So we are gonna say goodbye to this, and we are gonna bring over two more strings and tie the other two corners because that is how to make a mask. Did people wear cheesecloth because they thought it was cool? Or do you think it was just because it was what they had around at the time? Drop your answers below. Also, we're gonna go to the next corner. I did it. Ooh. We have our mask. So then, normally what you could do is then just tie it or you could tie it behind your head. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and tie it to where I could put it behind my ears. Um, just because I'm so used to wearing masks like this nowadays that I probably, it would take another 20 minutes just for me to tie it around my head. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and take the easy way out and tie it behind my ears. Like so. And... Like so. Ooh, okay, here we go. Oh, we did it. So if you guys have any more questions, please feel free to leave any comments or any questions like that below, and we will try to answer them during the live. But otherwise, thank you guys for watching and enjoy your mask. Go Pokes. So what you guys didn't see was about five minutes of film of me just not doing good. I didn't even correctly tie a knot. It was just not, not very good. So the person who edited that video I would like to thank you because you made me look a lot craftier than I really am. But one thing that I did benefit from that video is I was able to come up with a lot more questions about the Spanish flu. And so did you guys. Bonnie wants to know, did the yearbook document the pandemic or did they try to portray the year as normal? So the challenge with the yearbook, the, the 1919 yearbook is the one that would have documented that because it followed the, the year, uh, was focused on World War I. Uh, and so there's mentions of uh, the flu epidemic, but usually it's in relationship to World War I and, and service, uh, servicemen. So um, there's nothing really dramatic in the, in the yearbook about it. Um, so, but thanks, thanks for the question, Bonnie. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how did campus life change after the, pen, the epidemic? So did they um, just go back to normal? Did they have any other kind of lingering safety precautions? So uh, eventually it went back to normal. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if this would be a good point to really talk about some of the, the changes that, that occurred on campus while it was going on in that uh, as more and more people became sick, uh, initially they didn't isolate them. Um, but as those numbers grew, they began to isolate them uh, on campus. And so uh, there was a small home that was originally intended to be the president's home uh, that had been moved over near the boys' dormitory and initially I think about 10 to 12 of the young men were moved into there. But as, as the numbers swelled on campus, uh, eventually the whole uh, boys dormitory became an infirmary for the men. Um, and at the same time, uh, where the, the women's dormitory, it's, it's the Bartlett Center for the Studio Arts now, uh, where the women lived, um, eventually all of its floors and where they had residence rooms um, became an infirmary for the women. Um, and so uh, both, um, well, the School of Home Economics, um, their, their director, uh, Ruth Michaels, I think it was Ruth Michaels, um, she um, calls all classes off in, in home economics and, and all these young women then and, and the instructors in home economics begin caring for not only the women, um, but also the men. Um, and then what they also do is they give up their rooms if they have rooms there so that family members who are coming from, from outside of Stillwater have a place to stay. 
Now, of course, this creates additional problems because now you have people who are coming from outside of Stillwater staying in, in this residence hall, which is also housing people with the flu. Uh, and so some of the things they did kind of helped spread it, not only within Stillwater, but then with that, within the, uh, Oklahoma. Um, so it was, it was those kind of difficult things that were going on. Um, but as things, as the numbers decreased, uh, things went, kind of went back to normal. I mean, um, clubs started meeting again. Um, uh, the football team was playing again. Um, they did make one change for the November uh, game. Uh, it was against UCO. Um, there was no, no yelling was allowed. Um, uh, they, they eliminated cheering for that game. It was thought that if you cheered, you would, you would threaten your throat, uh, and that would be a, a, a problem for you. Uh, and so no cheers were allowed. And normally there was a pep uh, rally before the game, and they didn't allow the pep rally uh, before the game. Um, but eventually, uh, as the numbers again declined, uh, they would have pep rallies, and, and, and attendance at classes improved. And within, within, a, within six months, things had kind of gone back to normal. There would still be articles in the in the college paper. It was called the Orange and Black was the title of the paper at the time, about various little flu incidences. You know, an individual might might have gotten sick, or someone's family member might have gotten sick. But but uh, it, we really kind of went back to normal. And you know, at sometimes that's just what you want it to happen. Mm -hmm. That's just how you want things to be. Um, so I had mentioned in the video earlier that one of the materials that was used to make the masks during the Spanish flu was cheesecloth. And Helen wants to know, why did they not use handkerchiefs instead? So um, they were encouraging people to sneeze into their handkerchiefs or, or cough into their handkerchiefs. So rather than like into your elbow like we do now, they were saying to, to sneeze into a handkerchief. And so they probably considered the handkerchief as, as your backup. If you didn't have a mask, uh, you'd have your hanky. Uh, okay. So uh, that's probably why they didn't, didn't use the handkerchief. Well, and, and, um, and of course, men... Um, I'm not sure if, if every man carried a handkerchief or not, but uh, anyway, they, people were encouraged to sneeze into their handkerchiefs. Interesting. I'll tell you, my grandfather always had a handkerchief on him. Up until the end, always had a handkerchief on him. Well, I think that's true. I think men in, in years gone by used to carry handkerchiefs with them just for cases like that. So. Probably, you know, that, that does make sense. Bonnie also wants to know, did the 1918 pandemic impact enrollment at the time? Uh, no, it didn't. Um, our, our, our enrollment numbers were going up. Uh, like I said, we had roughly 1,700 uh, beginning that fall. Um, within a few years, we were up to 1,900. Uh, there was increased enrollment in part because of the Student uh, Army Training Corps, the young men who were there for military training. So, uh, no, it, it didn't impact enrollment at all. That's awesome. That's good to know. Um, what happened to students if they got sick? So you mentioned they went to the infirmary for a little bit. Right. Um, was it a situation where, you know, if they got better, did they have to then in turn help other sick students? So that was very common. So initially, you know, they would go, well, initially there was an infirmary room also in, in the women's building, and there was, a, there was an infirmary room in the boys' dormitory um, and in that house. Uh, so initially that's where they went. Uh, but the, the numbers exploded so rapidly uh, that those, those facilities quickly uh, were limited. And, and so... Um, so what would happen is um, people who had been sick and recovered then would help care for the people who were, were becoming sick. Um, and there were some people early on who weren't sick who were helping people who were sick and then would carry and carry the infection back to others. There was uh, one uh, young woman who was on the staff. Uh, she taught at the secondary school, which was kind of a, a pre-college um, course that, that students could take. Uh, her name was Aura Black. And at very, very early in the beginning in September, uh, she volunteered to help care, kind of serve as a nurse to help care for the sick. Uh, and by, by early October, uh, she had gotten the flu and she was the first person on campus, at least first staff person on campus to die of the flu. And so she passed away by mid-October. We had a young student, uh, John Connor, I think was his name, or Connell, um, who uh, uh, also uh, was helping friends who had the flu he contracted the disease and then uh, he passed uh, also in October. So we did have a couple of deaths associated with that. Um, but usually it was students helping care, care of other students, uh, women, uh, mostly women exclusively, I would say women from uh, home, what was home economics, uh, 
really acting as nurses, uh, delivering food uh, to people who were sick, delivering medicines, uh, all the all the supplies and stuff. Um, that was mostly women took over those those roles. You know, you mentioned the name Aura Black, and that actually reminded me of something. Um, just for a little bit of context about how fast the Spanish flu worked, uh, just two weeks earlier before she had contracted it or before she started helping with the students, she had taken girls out on a hiking trail. So it shows she was really healthy, and then unfortunately a couple weeks later she hadn't, she didn't survive. So it was, that was a fast-working flu. Uh, and she was only probably in her late 20s, early 30s, uh, so she was young, and we, we may be able to talk about some of the um, differences or similarities to about, about those things later. So William wants to know, do we know if there was any resistance to safety guidelines like we see today? Uh, there was. Uh, there were groups who, who wanted to continue meeting and so refused uh, to obey those limitations of the numbers of people. And this, not so much in, in, on, on campus, uh, but in Oklahoma and other places, um, there were anti-mask societies, groups who would refuse to wear masks. Uh, and so there was, uh, human nature hasn't changed that much. Uh, there were people who resisted uh, initially, and then as the numbers grew, the resistance declined. Uh, but there are other people who maintained their resistance all the way through. They, you know, they, they thought it was a, a farce, uh, that it was fake. Um, and uh, uh, so there was, there was, the human response is always, always varies greatly, um, but there was reaction to it. Uh, most people, though, did try to follow guidelines. Of course, one of the challenges like we have today is the guidelines seem to kind of change. You know, they didn't know much about the flu at first. And so as they learn more, they, they make adjustments. You know, and as we learn more about the coronavirus, we're trying to make adjustments. But it's a, it's a fluid situation uh, and the things are always, always changing. Absolutely. So Helen wants to know, how many students, faculty, or staff did pass away? So I can only document one student and one staff member on campus. Uh, there were several students who may have been on campus at the beginning and then left because of their illness uh, and passed away. I, I don't know, I don't have names for those individuals. Uh, we did have six former students who were now serving in the military um, who died of the flu uh, in, during their service. Uh, so there were others uh, in the community um, and on campus who passed, um, but that was, those are the only two that we can identify right now. Uh, it's very, very unfortunate that anybody had to pass. Um, but does the Spanish flu mean that it actually originated in Spain? So, uh, no, it did not. Um, I'm pretty sure it did not. They think uh, that it actually started in Kansas and that what happened is you had all these military trainings going on, both at colleges and universities, but also uh, the military uh, had set up um, various camps for training, prep prepping people for potential service in World War I as a part of the American Expeditionary Force. And so uh, there's a cook uh, at one of these military facilities in Kansas who's the first documented case. There were probably earlier cases. He had to get it from somewhere. Um, but what happened is with this movement of, of soldiers, uh, in fact, we had some of our training personnel for the Student Army Training Corps who had been in Kansas before and then came down here to train soldiers here. But you had this movement of, of military, um, both Within the, within the country, within the United States, but also overseas as we're, as we're moving people to, to France um, to fight, um, it, it just spread very quickly. Um, um, but they think it actually may have started in Kansas. The reason it's called the Spanish flu is, you know, I, I mentioned it started in spring of 1918. Well, so you've got the, the, the Germans and the French uh, and the English are mostly involved. Um, the, the Americans are really just starting to get involved. But they don't want to talk about it. They don't. They don't want to do anything that's going to hurt morale. And so it's 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 affecting all of their troops. But none of them are talking about it. Spain, which was a neutral country, and it was in, impacting the populations in Spain and their king, uh, Alfonso, uh, Alfonso, I think the thirteenth, came down with the flu. And so Spain, it's in the papers. They're they're talking about it. And so the first kind of public notice that people get is it's from Spain. It's that's where they're. And so they assume it started in Spain. And actually, it probably started in, in Kansas. Our next door neighbor. Our next door neighbor, next hard door. to believe. That is, that is crazy to think about. Um, so you had mentioned a little bit before about how the yearbook had really focused on World War I. Mm -hmm. um, so we know that you know the Spanish flu wasn't really the only thing that was occupying the country's mind. We were also dealing with World War I. 
Um, how did the Spanish flu affect the First World War, if at all? So it, fairly dramatically. In fact, for the U.S. at least, more U.S. soldiers died of the flu than died in battle. And so there, there are large numbers of, of individuals who, who passed uh, because of the pandemic um, and either never made it overseas. A number of people died both in the States while they were in training and even those after those, those who went overseas uh, died. And so for all Germans, French, uh, British and Americans, all those forces um, uh, had similar rates. Some of them were a little bit different, but similar rates. But like in the, in the U.S., uh, the military, if they were in the Navy, they had a higher rate of the flu than uh, the Army. Well, they think that was because the Navy were operating these ships carrying people back and forth. Uh, so it had an impact on the war, a uh, uh, fairly dramatic impact on the war. Um, that's, so. that's just bonkers. Yeah. So crazy. I actually I didn't know <coughs> that it had killed more people than combat did. For the for American forces. I'm not sure if that's true for the the Germans, French, and, and British, mm -hmm. but I know for the American forces, more died of the flu than died in combat. That That's something I, I never learned, so that is really interesting to hear about. So with COVID-19, symptoms are worse in some than others. So for example, those who are most affected by the symptoms of COVID happen to be older in age. Was it like that at all with uh, the Spanish flu? So it was a little bit different. So like, like you said with COVID, I think over 80% of, of the cases uh, where people have passed in Oklahoma are over 65. Well, with uh, the influenza, the Spanish flu, uh, a large number under five passed away, um, and then a large number between the age of 20 and 40 passed away, and then a large group over 65 passed away, but it was more evenly distributed between those three groups um, than we have, of course, now. They think part of it was, was the human body's immune system overreacting, and so children actually have fairly good immune systems and it just, it just overreacted, same with young people, um, uh, 20 to 40. Uh, and so the demographics were a little bit different. Uh, and so it was a little, it was a little scarier for everybody because they either were or, or knew someone in those age groups. That is, wow. So David, you have been so awesome in helping us get to know a little bit more about the Spanish flu and really how it relates to COVID. <clears throat> is there anything else you wanted to include before we sign off for the evening? Well, just, Ultimately on campus, roughly a third of our students and staff came down with the flu. And so at the time that only impacted about 500 individuals. But I don't think, I mean, can we imagine today roughly a third of our campus coming down with COVID? It would just be massive numbers compared to, you know, back then, but still a third of your population uh, at some point becomes sick. And so I think it, it was, it's really significant for people. It is kind of amazing how quickly they, they went back to what they called normal <clears throat> after that. Uh, the thing I think to be aware of, there's there's over 200 human viruses uh, and people, you know, uh, doctors are discovering three or four more each year. So we're going to continue to have these kinds of things. Uh, we just have to figure out how to manage them when they happen. Absolutely. This has been such a cool archives live for me, uh, just because it's really interesting, like I said before, to relate a similar experience from the past to what you're going through today with COVID and the Spanish flu. If you want to learn more about uh, the Spanish flu's impact on Oklahoma State, read David's article, Spanish flu hit an unprepared Oklahoma A&M campus in 1918 at Oklahoma State's official magazine, State. And if you want to learn more about the Oklahoma State's archives, visit archives.library.okstate.edu. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to DM us on Facebook at Oklahoma State University Archives. David, <laughs> that was a huge information bomb. But thank you so much for meeting with me today. And thank you to everyone who watched. Remember, stay safe and go Pokes.